this nine. Okay, so uh, we can start. Anantha, you can. Uh, Okay, so firstly, I request all the participants to kindly. Okay, so greetings to all participants and to our speaker. So we are privileged today to have uh, to have with us uh, Professor Rowan Gordon from Canada. So I welcome you all to the IEEE virtual talk 2020. And today the talk is focused on nanoplasmonics. So before starting the talk, I would like to uh, uh, introduce our speaker. So Professor Ruen is a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at University of Victoria, Canada. He has received many awards, so I'll be mentioning some of them here. So he is he's the recipient of Canadian Advanced Technology Alliance Award in 2001, an Accelerate BC Impact Award 2000, uh, 2007, and I go a visiting professor fellowship in 2009, the Canada Research Chair in Plasmonics 2009-2019, the Silver Medal for Research Excellence 2011, a Fulbright Fellowship Award in 2016, a NSC Discovery Accelerator Award in 2017, Faculty of Engineering Teaching Award 2017, and a JSPS Invitational Fellowship in 2020 recently. So he's a fellow of the Optical Society of his OSA, the Society of Photographic Instrumentation Engineers at his PI, and Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers at his IEEE. Professor Ruen has authored and co-authored over 170 journal papers, including 13 invited contributions. He is co-inventor for five patents and two patent applications are under process. This, uh, Professor Gordon is the professional engineer of BC, and he has also been recognized as an outstanding referee for uh, by the um, physical society. He has also served as conference chair for various conferences, including SPY Nanoscience, Engineering, and NFO 16. He is also the associate editor for Optics Express and on the editorial advisory board for advanced optical materials. So with this brief intro, I present a red carpet welcome to our Speaker, Professor Owen. Yes, over to you, sir. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, so I understand that uh, many at your institute are working on uh, plasmonics, so uh, hopefully uh, you can learn something from my talk, but maybe you're already experts in this area. So uh, on this slide, uh, you can see uh, two of my former students. One is Yunjie Pang, who's a uh, uh, a Thousand Talents professor now in China, and Anna Asqui, who uh, works for Intel. Uh, and here they are working on the optical tweezer setup in my lab. Okay, so this talk is uh, really uh, a tutorial, um, but with some research in it as well, trying to introduce some of the concepts of nanoplasmonics, but particularly I'm interested in uh, describing how we can uh, reach single molecule sensitivity or even single atom sensitivity, uh, how to really maximize the enhancements that you get from nanoplasmonics. And um, there are two recent uh, papers um, that, that I have uh, written that kind of talk about some of the things that are in this talk. So if you're interested, you can look at these two works over here. Uh, the first one is really exploring some of the, uh, the techniques to, uh, or what are the limits of, of plasmonic enhancement and trying to see fundamentally how, how much we can push the uh, enhancement that you get from metal nanostructures, uh, the electromagnetic enhancement from metal nanostructures. The second one is ma mainly based on uh, all the technologies that have been produced uh, with nanostructured metals. So um, when I say technologies, I mean like real uh, commercial applications and potential commercial applications. Now, uh, I probably don't need to tell you this, but, but certainly uh, plasmonics has uh, received a lot of attention in the last two decades or so. Um, these are citations to the paper on the response of metals, noble metals by Johnson and Christie, and you can see that uh, although plasmonics has been around for quite some time, 
uh, only in the last two decades there's been a huge surge in the amount of research uh, that has um, come, come in this field. And this is mainly because of a couple of factors. I attribute it to uh, the advances in nanotechnology, so the ability to nanostructure materials with more control, with uh, techniques like the focus ion beam milling machine, uh, scanning electron uh, microscopy, electron microscopy, uh, scanning probe methods that ha were developed along this time, as well as uh, the ability for computers to simulate effectively structures. Uh, so the computational power has had a, an important role in driving this research forward as people are able to understand better uh, how metal nanostructures work. Uh, and, and finally, there's been some applications that have come out um, and some surprising results, which, which really uh, have also driven the field along. Okay, so first, uh, for those of you who aren't working specifically in the area of plasmonics, I just wanted to give an overview of what, what that is. Uh, from a historical perspective, uh, we have known that, that nanostructure and metals can provide vivid colors uh, here's an example of the Thurgus cup uh, from the 4th century BC. And you can see that um, if you, in the transmission mode, it looks, it looks red, and in the scattering mode, it looks green. And this is because the, the cup has nanoparticles, metal nanoparticles embedded in, in the glass. As well, we have these colloidal nanoparticles, which are basically floating, uh, floating suspension of, of gold nanoparticles that were produced by Michael Faraday in 1856, and they're still uh, there. You can still see these vivid colors, uh, this, this red color from it, uh, even today. So, so this shows uh, the robustness and the, the bright colors that you can get from uh, nanoparticle metals. So where does this color come from, this, this strong color? Uh, and you can see here, um, there is uh, the, the paper by Gustav Mee. Uh, I just want to check in. Is everyone hearing me okay? Yes, all good. Okay, okay good. So, so this paper was written in, in 1907, and you see that uh, even at this point, uh, uh, Mee recognized that um, you could use Rayleigh's formula to describe the absorption and scattering of metal nanoparticles uh, and th that were um, you know, nanometer in size or, or tens of nanometers in size, and he, he produced the, the spectral response. Uh, he then had a more substantial paper in 1908 where, he, he, uh, where we have all of the Mi resonances are fully described, so um, that's just a, a more detailed uh, uh, paper which, which looks at larger uh, structures, uh, larger spherical structures. But essentially, uh, it was entirely understood where the color from these metal nanoparticles came from even back in 1907. It was just Rayleigh scattering. Uh, particularly if you use Rayleigh's formula over here, uh, you have uh, terms that involve the volume, you have terms that involve the wavelength, but most important is this term over here. Let me see if I can try to get my um, yeah, over, the, over here, this term in the denominator, uh, for, um, for, girl, for gold, you can have the situation where, where the index is actually uh, is, is complex, and when you square it, uh, it's actually, it has a negative part, and so this denominator can, can go close to zero or can be made very small uh, when the real part of the surrounding material and the... Um, the metal, uh, they, they lead to this denominator uh, having a real part which goes to zero. And as a result, you get a large enhancement in the scattering at that, at that point. And so this was recognized already uh, back in 1907. So uh, not much has changed since then. Uh, so one thing that's critical here is that the permittivity of the metal has to be negative. And here's some more recent data uh, which shows the permittivity of uh, gold, um, uh, the real and imaginary parts. And this is for uh, the infrared regime. And you see that a free electron model, uh, which is where the formula is given on the bottom here, 
it fits pretty well for a lot of this uh, of this range, okay? Uh, until we get into, this is the real part, I should say, uh, until we get into the visible part of the spectrum, uh, yeah, to visible to UV, then you have interband uh, transitions that, so the free electron model, which is shown over here, somewhat departs. Uh, but, but essentially we can, we can look at the permittivity of a metal and we can describe it with this formula where the plasma frequency is related to the electron density uh, and um, uh, the gamma is the scattering rate of the electrons. And here we have uh, the imaginary part, which is also fit with this free electron model. Again, the agreement is really good uh, in the infrared and, and um, the red uh, part of the spectrum. As you move more to the blue um, and, and green part of the spectrum, you get some uh, deviations there. But in the infrared, certainly the free electron model is very good to describe this. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the free electron model uh, essentially treats electrons as, as freely moving particles. Uh, they have some mass and some acceleration, and they are moving under the application of an applied field. Um, when they're accelerated by this field, they will also uh, scatter with some scatter rate gamma, and this is going to be proportional to their velocity, which is a sort of a... Um, it's a standard um, uh, damping model to have the, the rate of change of the acceleration proportional to the velocity. And so if you substitute in uh, the velocity of the electrons and assume you have a sinusoidally varying field, electric field like this, and you assume the electrons also have that sinusoidal dependence, then you can solve for um, the velocity. It just becomes an algebraic equation at that point. And so you can get the current density in terms of the um, conductivity, and the conductivity is given by this formula here. And we note that from Maxwell's equations um, that uh, J, the, the um, current density, and the rate of change of the displacement vector, they, they kind of take the same position in Maxwell's equation. So physically, they're kind of the same thing, and that's what's being written here. Uh, but you obviously have to have this minus I omega and an epsilon naught factor here. And from this, we can find by comparing this relation over here with, uh, with this conductivity found in this formula, we can find that the relative um, permittivity is given by this expression over here. So that is uh, essentially uh, the Drude model in a nutshell. Uh, it's very simple. It's just looking at the... Uh, force equation on an electron with scattering. Okay, so this is what we know so far in this presentation that uh, electrons have negative permittivity, and this has allowed us to uh, recognize that they have very strong scattering uh, and absorption, and it's fit with this uh, Rayleigh scattering formula very well for small particles. Okay, so um, you can become a little bit more sophisticated and look at objects that are not just simple spheres uh, and understand also where this resonance is coming from by using a simple circuit model. Uh, essentially, you can think of uh, plasmonics as, or as uh, circuit theory for uh, electromagnetic fields in, in the uh, visible and near-infrared regime. And uh, so this is uh, hundreds of terahertz or 300 terahertz in higher frequencies. And uh, for those frequencies, you can, you can come up with, with where this resonance is coming from. Essentially, your gold nanosphere will have a capacitor, capacitance associated with it, and it will have an inductance associated with it. And if we use the usual formula um, for the resonance of an LC circuit, we can find that the resonance occurs when the permittivity equals minus 2, which is the surrounding uh, uh, um, uh, when the, which this is for having a, a surrounding vacuum material. So we get the same uh, resonance response here uh, from a circuit model uh, if you use the appropriate uh, capacitance and inductance values here. So essentially, uh, inductance, uh, where does the inductance come from? Well, if you have a capacitor, uh, uh, you can write um, the capacitance uh, in terms of the, the permittivity of the material, 
if you have uh, negative permittivity, then you have like a negative capacitance. And if you look at uh, an equation for a circuit over here, a negative capacitance uh, kind of plays the same role as an inductance from this formula. Okay, so so negative capacitance is is kind of like inductance, and so it's the negative um, it's the inductive response of the electrons which gives you the inductance part of this this resonance circuit, uh, which is a nanosphere in this case. And uh, it's the, the surrounding material gives you the capacitor part. And when you put those two together, you get the resonance. So that is really the, the resonance that we see in this plasmonic resonance, okay? Uh, why is this useful? Well, you can extend this idea to other uh, shapes of particles. For example, here is a nano rod which has rounded ends. And the rounded ends you can treat as this uh, inductance uh, with capacitance. And obviously, you're going to get some resistance for the loss of the metal. For the length of the rod, you can use the Sommerfeld wave, which was known since uh, 1899. Uh, Sommerfeld and Zinnick, you know, described these waves uh, on metal lines and on metal ground planes. And these are essentially have the same formulations as surface plasmons. So these are the, are the same uh, surface plasmon waves that we know about today. Um, but, but they were mainly interested in, in uh, uh, radio frequency types of applications. But in nevertheless, you can use this, this, uh, the propagation of the Sommerfeld wave, and at the end of, the, of this line of this rod, you have the end phase reflection, which is given by the circuit model of the, the end phase or half a sphere. And from this, you can accurately predict the reflection uh, phase and amplitude, and you can get the resonant frequencies of this nanorod circuit. So, so these nanorods can be described with a circuit theory, okay? So without having to basically solve uh, the full electromagnetic field around the rod, you can get a pretty good description just from the circuit theory. Okay, uh, are there any questions at this point? Okay, I'm not hearing any questions, so I'll just uh, continue here. Uh, you can hear me fine. Hello, uh, I have one question. Uh, oh, please, yeah. Yeah, uh, you were talking about negative capacitance. Can we relate it to the EAS as well? In the case of surface, uh, circuit fitting during EAS, electro spectrum spectrum, can we relate it to? Uh, Sorry, I uh, maybe um, is it possible to write the question in the chat? Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can. Uh, how do I how do I see the chat now? Okay. Um, take it later, sir. We'll take it later. Uh, take it later, sir. No issues. Okay. Then, Sir, you can switch uh, to the slideshow, and then we can take it later. Sir. Okay. Well, I, I've got the chat up now. So if you just want to write your question in the chat quickly. Uh, negative capacitance, is it the same for EIS? Um, what is EIS, sorry? Electromagnetic induced. Impedance to spectroscopy. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, no problem. So, uh, no problem. Okay. I, I, uh, I'm not familiar with that. I'm sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll go back to sharing the slides. So you can see the slide show now. Oh, I have to go to display settings. So you, yeah. See if we could. Duplicate slide show.
Okay. Okay, so um, so the question I'm asking here is, we know that you can get a large field uh, scattering. Uh, one thing I didn't say explicitly is also the local field, the, the uh, volts per meter uh, that you experience close to the metal, uh, very close to the metal, will also be very much enhanced at these resonances. And so um, the question is, how much can we make this, this local field? Um, because many applications require having a very high local field um, intensity. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about what applications they are. I uh, hear that, that uh, your institute is, is heavily involved in the areas of sensing and uh, solar energy. Uh, so with sensing, uh, certainly uh, a mature technology is the surface plasma on resonance sensing. So here you have a gold film, and you couple light through a prism into the surface waves of this gold film. And when the light couples into the surface wave, you actually uh, you experience losses in the in the light propagation. And so the light that then reflects back is reduced in intensity. And by looking at, by adding stuff to the surface, by adding um, uh, proteins, for example, to the surface or something else that you want to sense, uh, the, the wave will propagate at a different rate and the coupling will happen at a different uh, angle or a different uh, wavelength if you're tuning wavelength. And then you can sense the binding of, of particles at sort of the picogram per millimeter squared um, level uh, at the, on the surface. So this uh, technology, uh, I said it's mature. It's, uh, was, it's been developed by Biacor uh, in Sweden and, and was bought out by GE uh, Healthcare uh, a number of years ago. When it was first developed, it was based on this Kretschmann uh, Rater geometry for light coupling. Uh, at that time, people were interested in using lasers and detectors and uh, there was this, uh, both arms would move the laser and the detector arm and so you'd scan through different angles, and you would, uh, you would detect at different angles and look at the coupling uh, when you attach uh, something to a surface, a sensing surface. So here you see on the sensing surface you have these antibodies, and there's uh, something that the antibodies are sensitive to binding to them, these circles over here. Uh, oh, sorry. So you see a circle over there. So this uh, technique evolved from these first uh, kind of applications where people really realized you don't really want to use a laser because they're complicated to control. They have other types of noise associated with them. Uh, Drive-in laser, you need a constant current source, whereas with an LED, you can just uh, bias it. Uh, so you really want to use an LED, which is more stable. Um, and you can also have speckle issues with lasers. Uh, so, so an LED is, is giving you incoherent light, so it's much better to use an LED. Uh, they also realize that you want to pick the wavelength of the LED to be where your detector is maximizing its response, uh, and also where gold is behaving quite well. And so typically the wavelength chosen was around 617 nanometers for the LED. And then you also wanted, did not want to use any moving parts, so you use a detector array. And uh, you want to be detecting all the time, so you don't want to be uh, just detecting at one position um, and then moving to another position, because you basically you, the more photons you get, the better your um, your uh, your response of your detector will be. Uh, so essentially, you, you're fighting against uh, um, the signal to noise ratio will be related to the amount of photons that you collect or the square root of the number of photons that you collect. So you want to be detecting for as much time as possible, or as you want to be detecting all angles uh, continuously, and so that's why they use a detector array. They also use a, a narrower channel, and the idea there, you don't want to be waiting for something to diffuse to the surface um, where you're detecting it, but rather you want it to be pretty close to the surface. And they also change the, the sensing surface by having these dextrin um, strands where you can have a lot more uh, sensing happening here over a volume close to the surface. So you can have a lot more aerial 
increased. So there was a lot of uh, technological uh, advances which led this to becoming a mature technology. Here's an example of one of these machines, okay, from Biocore. So, so even though it's a simple concept and it's been known for quite a while, there was a lot of technology that went in making this a real uh, um, uh, technology. Okay. Now, there are a lot of other applications where, where surface plasmon um, uh, or plasmonics is very, uh, very exciting. Uh, one of these is in surface enhanced Brahman scattering. Uh, this has the benefit of uh, making use of the electromagnetic field enhancement, both for an incident uh, wave uh, and for uh, oops sorry and for uh, the scattered wave which is at a slightly different wavelength now it helps that with plasmonics you have broad resonances and so um, you can enhance both of these wavelengths at the same time and so uh, whereas the enhancements will, will, uh, of the local field will benefit the incident waves as the square, the scattered wave will also benefit as the square, and so overall you get a fault power enhancement in the, in the uh, Raman signal. So something which, uh, if, if you have something that's fairly um, moderate, like a thousand times field enhancement, uh, then overall you get 10 to the 12 overall enhancement. Uh, in your Raman signal, and this really allows Raman to be to achieve single molecule sensitivity. Of course, the, this is a commercial application, although it has not done as well as SPR. Uh, there are examples where you can buy Raman substrates, uh, which are metal nanostructured metal substrates, which allow for for enhancing the the spectrum uh, that you get, the Raman spectrum that you get. There's also, you can buy near field uh, uh, scanning microscopes which have tip enhanced Raman, so you use a sharp metal tip, uh, usually above a metal surface to, to scan across the surface and figure out what the Raman uh, enhancement is along the surface. Okay, so another technology uh, which is up and coming and I think it will become more and more important as time goes on is this idea of information, uh, trying to use plasmonics for information technology. So if you want to uh, use optics and you want to have electrodes there um, close to your uh, optical signal, uh, and if you want to be very close and you want to have small capacitances, um, then you want to use nanotechnology and you're sort of forced to use a metal for your electrodes, so why not use your metal also to enhance the local field interaction? And this is what is shown here from, uh, as a collaboration between uh, um, your Bluefolds group and, and, um, and um, uh, University of Washington's uh, group, where uh, they placed, um, Larry Dalton's group at University of Washington, where they placed uh, nonlinear optical materials uh, uh, inside a slot which is only 75 nanometers wide. Uh, it's a capacitive uh, junction and uh, they can basically take a radio frequency uh, signal and uh, encode it on a fiber optic communication waveguide by using um, this antenna, uh, RF antenna coupled to a slot waveguide uh, which is a, which is a radio frequency, which is a sorry, a plasmonic waveguide. So so essentially, uh, the nice thing about this is there's no electronic bias to the system. It's entirely passive in some ways. So the the radio frequency comes in and it modulates a CW laser, and they could transmit information along a fiber optic channel um, or coupled between a radio frequency channel and a fiber optic channel. So this would be sort of your wireless to uh, fiber optic communication coupling without any power supply, without any power source uh, at the antenna there. So that's a very exciting use of this, of this uh, plasmonics to, to give you the types of enhancements you need to, to uh, transmit. Uh, of course, uh, as we go to higher and higher frequencies, we're in, entering into the terahertz regime. And here, uh, plasmonics can help you uh, because it enhances the local field, enhances the response of materials, and so your electrons are produced closer to, uh, to the electrodes, and as a result, they can be swept out of uh, a, a junction uh, faster, 
and you can have a faster response. So we've uh, we've been exploring these terahertz fields. So terahertz is a, a thousand gigahertz. So it's where uh, radio frequency or information technologies are going in, into the into the terahertz regime. Uh, it's kind of at the limit of what you can do with electronics. So it's beyond the limit of what you can do with electronics, but it's also uh, beyond what you can do with with infrared um, types of technology. So so it's kind of this dark zone of the electromagnetic spectrum where we want to push communication and information uh, processing because uh, we want them to, to go faster. We want to have more information processing capability, but it's also useful for many different sensing applications. So here we use the plasmonic uh, electrodes to, to um, have very fast sweep out of electrons, and then we could, could have a very good response even from just normal gallium arsenide. So that was uh, one area where we, we patented uh, uh, using plasmonics for terahertz um, uh, photoconductive antennas. Uh, here's another example where we use low temperature grown gallium arsenide, which has arsenic clusters in the mid gap state. So this is the energy of the, of the electrons in the semiconductor. And we can then use very inexpensive 1.57 femtosecond, uh, 1.57 micro, micrometer wavelength femtosecond lasers. These are very inexpensive lasers. We can use these lasers to, to pump um, these photoconductive antennas, and we can get enough efficiency from this two-photon process by making use of plasmonics. And so essentially, uh, I have a question there. I'll get to this. I, I just want to finish what I'm saying here. Essentially, with this approach, we can outperform uh, the commercial devices which use complicated indium gallium arsenide materials uh, by using low temperature gallium arsenide and this two photon absorption, which is only enabled, the efficiency is only enabled by having this, this, um, this uh, plasmonic enhancement. So I just want to access um, the chat here. Does this say? Uh, when you're saying this technolo technology, you're referring to the terahertz, uh, mm -hmm. the photoconductive antennas? So for these photoconductive antennas, definitely they have um, uh, they have not really uh, made their way into communication, although a lot of people are interested in that. One of the applications you can imagine would be for high performance computing, uh, um, motherboard to motherboard. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. For microchip and integrated circuits, uh, for for motherboard to motherboard communication, for on uh, on chip uh, communication. Uh, a lot of people are interested in using photonics for this type of application, uh, but um, uh, Chris sends to edit the shared content. Uh, I'm going to decline the request to yes. edit the shared content. Ignore it, sir. Ignore it. Sir. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, uh, yes, there are people that are interested in this, uh, and it is a great application, but certainly it hasn't, it hasn't really taken off yet. Um, uh, it still is something that's, that's at the research phase. Uh, but for, for spectroscopy and sensing applications, uh, these are commercial uh, prospects. You can buy photoconductive antennas, and they're being sold by a number of companies for, for this application. Okay, so I'll just close the chat and continue with the presentation here. Hopefully that answered your question. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so here's an interesting application. Uh, a phaser is essentially uh, it's like a laser, so you, you have a gain uh, through stimulated emission. The only difference is that the, the gain happens all in the near field, so you don't have any propagating waves. So in a usual laser, we think of a cavity and we think of the photons bouncing back and forth between two mirrors, for example or running around in a whispering gallery type of um, configuration. But with the spacer, uh, what you have is photons are emitted in the near field. Uh, they couple to the gain medium in the near field, and they, uh, uh, they then are coupled through, maybe through scattering to the far field. So everything happens in the near field. There is no propagation here. And so this means you can make really tiny lasers, much smaller than the wavelength of light. Of, so the actual laser itself physically is smaller than the wavelength of light. 
And then you can have very sharp um, emission from, from these nanoparticles, uh, which are, are nano lasers. And this is useful because uh, a lot of people want to use like markers um, in bio applications, for example. Uh, here we have the ability to have many sharp uh, markers on a single cell, for example. And as a result, we can add many different types of markers together and multiplex them as a function of wavelength. Uh, so you can have dense integration of multiple markers. Uh, and you also have a very bright signal that comes from these nanolasers. So, so it will be uh, potentially brighter than, than other types of um, just uh, fluorescent emitters. Uh, and finally, there's the application of optical tweezers, which my group has been working on a lot. Uh, and certainly, uh, optical tweezers work by enhancing um, the local field. Uh, the, the deeper, the, the, the higher the local field intensity, the deeper the potential well for trapping. Uh, of course, you can just crank up the power of your trapping laser, um, but this will not give you the same level of localization, and it can also lead to overall damage and, and heating. Uh, so, so this is a, a way of holding onto particles which are less than 100 nanometers in size with, with uh, moderate optical powers, but ha having very high local field intensities. Uh, and we've been able to use apertures in metal films for holding on to just single proteins. And here's an example uh, where we've tried to patent the, the, the use of this for protein analysis. Uh, other people have been using these apertures in metal films for, for looking at quantum dots. Uh, you can get enhancement from the, from the trapping laser and get two photon excitation of the quantum dots. Uh, you can look at uh, you can combine this with nanopore technologies, which uh, is another area where people put DNA and proteins and, and feed them through small pores in a, in a film. And this, um, uh, this leads to, I, I saw a question there, I'll get to that in a second, but I'll just finish this, this thought. Uh, this nanopore is allow you to, to sort of look at uh, translocation of biomaterials and, and their interactions. And this uh, has potential for, for sequencing. Uh, by adding this plasmonic material around there, you can also uh, trap particles close to the pore or in the pore, and you can get an optical signal as well as the ionic current signal that you usually get from the nanopore. Okay, so let's see if I can answer this question here. Uh, typically, uh, Potentially, the electron current and the hole current could both um, contribute, uh, but, but typically it's, it's the electron um, uh, current, uh, the free electrons that, that are, are uh, contributing uh, primarily. Uh, okay, four plasmonic fixed figure. Uh, this plasmonics can occur at any interface between a metal and a dielectric, as long as you have the capacitive part and the, uh, of the dielectric and the inductive part of the, of the metal, then you can have a plasmonic resonance there. Uh, so, so it's not really particular to uh, a specific incident geometry. Okay, I'll continue with the, the presentation here. Okay, uh, people have looked at uh, single proteins uh, in these, uh, in, with these nanopores, combining with the nanopores. Uh, one thing that we've been looking at, and this might have applications for, for some of the energy uh, things that I've, I've heard that um, uh, are being worked on at your institute, uh, is this upconverter. So these take energy, uh, infrared energy, like 980 nanometer photons uh, or 1550 nanometer photons, and convert them into visible light that can then uh, be absorbed by silicon uh, um, uh, photovoltaics. So, so lots of people are interested in looking at uh, lanthanides like, like erbium, particularly for this up conversion process. Uh, and we've trapped uh, nanocrystals that have up converters, so erbium inside them, also in terbium to sensitize this 980 nanometer transition. And so essentially what you do, what you have in this erbium atom is a bunch of levels for the electrons and because these levels are so long lived, the electrons can be excited from uh, an intermediate level up into a higher energy level 
by the absorption of a second photon or by some energy exchange process with ytterbium in this case. And the result is that now you have enough energy for this electron to emit in the green or the red part of the spectrum. If you absorb a third photon, you can also emit in the blue part of the spectrum. So this is a way to, to take all that energy that's not absorbed by, by, um, by your uh, silicon uh, photovoltaics and convert it into a wavelength that can be absorbed by a silicon photovoltaics. So it's a way to enhance the efficiency of existing uh, solar cells. Of course, uh, you get enhancement in these apertures, metal nanostructured apertures. So the, in this case, we're using a simple rectangle. And this enhancement can be at the pump-in wavelength, so at 980 nanometers, but it can also be at the emission wavelength of 650 nanometers or 550 nanometers. And overall, the enhancement of this process can be 400 times. And so you can get very bright enhancement of these, these uh, weak erbium uh, transitions, optical transitions. And so you can make this process a lot more efficient. We're also interested in using this for single photon sources. So you can imagine if you have erbium, one erbium or two erbiums in each nanocrystal, each of these erbiums can be a source of individual photons. And so you can think of quantum technologies that make use of transmitting individual photons one at a time. Here's an example of a paper that was published recently from my group where we've uh, reduced the number of erbiums in these nanocrystals down to the level of zero, one, two, or three. And then we see discrete levels of emission. So for uh, presumably for single erbiums, we get the level of around 20 counts uh, of photon emission at 660 nanometers. Uh, and a lot of the time, you, you, you get no emission, which indicates that you have no erbiums in that nanocrystal, uh, or at least no actively emitting erbiums. And we compared this with the actual concentration that we prepared, and we found uh, good agreement. We understand this process quite well. So this is a way to use plasmonic tweezers to actively select single photon emitter uh, sources in, up in, uh, in uh, nanocrystals. So to select single erbium ions in nanocrystals as single photon emitters. Uh, Looking at the single ion level, um, this is uh, another uh, uh, example where you can actually sense even single ions. This is from uh, Vollmer's group, um, and uh, you can see that he's managed to uh, sense uh, zinc, uh, single attachment of zinc and mercury to uh, a metal nanorod. And he's combined this metal nanorod with, uh, with uh, Whisper and Gallery mode uh, sensors to get the overall enhancement in the sensitivity. But it's really at the single ion level, so it's, it's super sensitive. Uh, it's about as sensitive as you'd want to get. OK, so uh, let's, uh, I'm going to pause here uh, and, and just uh, uh, switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about um, you know, what makes plasmonics good and how can we make, uh, get even more field enhancement. Uh, one thing we can recognize is, is in a parallel plate capacitor, the, the field in the gap um, for the same voltage goes up inversely as the, as the distance in the gap. Uh, so, so we can make the gap smaller. Uh, so if you have the two metals and you make the gap smaller, you get a higher field. But this can also, this nanostructuring can also be seen for, for nanoparticles. So, if you look at the field enhancement on an ellipsoid, uh, 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 which has uh, the minor axes have the same, the same uh, dimension, uh, so uh, you'll see that um, the, so the spheroid uh, ellipsoid uh, has a field enhancement, which you can write the formula for explicitly, as shown here. And you can see that uh, in the denominator, you have this volume term. And so if you make this volume as small as possible, then essentially you can make the field enhancement as large as possible. Okay, so you want to make things really small uh, in plasmonics. Uh, one thing we also notice, and this is a little bit counterintuitive, a lot of people talk about using plasmonics in the visible part of the spectrum, and this is good for many applications. Uh, you get a broad resonance and it allows for enhancement in the visible part of the spectrum. But if you really look at the maximum field enhancement, 
you notice that uh, you can take this formula and you can uh, manipulate it somewhat. It's not very hard to do this. And you find that the maximum enhancement goes as the magnitude of the permittivity of the metal. Uh, and as you go to the infrared, the permittivity, the magnitude of the permittivity of the metal increases. It also goes as the real part of the permittivity of the metal, the magnitude of that. And that also it becomes more and more negative, so that also increases. Uh, you obviously have to divide through by the imaginary part of the permittivity of the metal because there's going to be some losses. And although these get larger in the, as you go to longer wavelengths, uh, because you have these other terms in the numerator, uh, overall it really benefits you to go to longer and longer wavelengths when you're using plasmonics. So that's a little bit counterintuitive to what people usually talk about in the literature. Uh, plasmonics in the infrared is actually going to perform better in many applications. Uh, I'm not the only person who's saying this. This is um, um, this is a work that came out of MIT where where they they look at the scattering from an object and and uh, we notice um, a similar formulation. It's slightly different uh, because of how they how they looked at the, this um, this uh, uh, this figure of merit. Uh, but essentially, you see the same kind of curves here in their figure and in my figure uh, that are produced there. Uh, you want to use a, a good plasmonic metal, and you want to go into the infrared. Uh, so I noticed there was a question there. I'll just take that question. Uh, okay, so, okay, so the question was, why not other metals? I'm getting uh, a little bit of feedback there. Sir, there is an issue with the voice. Can you, uh, can you mute yourself? yourself? Uh, uh, okay. Okay. That, 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 so, so somebody, somebody's, somebody's uh, uh, not muted. muted. Okay, sir. Go ahead. I, I'm muted over here. Oh, okay. okay. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, we have this. Um, the question was whether you can have use other metals, and yes, you can. And this figure actually shows it quite nicely. Uh, they're looking at other types of metals and even um, uh, conducting uh, semiconductors um, or semi-metals. Uh, indium tin oxide is one of them. Uh, so, so this is one that, that uh, but, but really the best metals uh, are the noble metals. You can see here silver, aluminum. Uh, well, aluminum is not a noble metal, but it has a high electron density, so it performs quite well. Um, uh, gold, copper uh, are, are doing quite well here. Uh, whereas if you go to some of these dopes, uh, semiconductors, uh, or, or um, other types of materials like silicon carbide, which has a sort of uh, polaritonic resonance, it's not going to do as well. Uh, erbium, I'm not sure. Uh, as a metal itself, uh, it might be okay. Um, but it's not uh, it's not a great metal as I understand it, and and if you do use it as a metal, then it's not going to be um, it's not going to be having the emission properties that you you're interested in. Uh, so it's really erbium ions you're interested in, single ions. Okay, uh, I'll continue now. Um, okay, so longer wavelengths. Okay, so this is what we know so far. We want to make everything small. Um, Plasmonics is kind of like nanocircuits uh, that give resonances in the visible and IR, and, and the resonance comes from the inductive part of the electrons and the capacitive part of the surrounding material. So you need both of those things. Um, and it can give large field enhancements. Uh, and uh, we can, by making the object smaller and by using the correct metals and working at longer wavelengths, we can get large enhancement. But what are the actual limits to this enhancement? Uh, can I just ask how much time I have? I notice I've been speaking for quite a while here. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, sir, I didn't get you. Uh, get you? I uh, sure. I I can spend about ten more minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, sir. Okay. Okay. So uh, we're obviously interested in material losses. Um, and you can make better materials. You can look at single crystal materials. You can go to lower temperatures to try and reduce the losses. Um, this can give you some benefits, like a factor of three in some cases, but it's, often it's not really worth the effort. 
Uh, you can try to make smoother surfaces um, to, to have a better response uh, so you won't have as much scattering losses. Um, so you can do that through things like template stripling, so you can evaporate on a crystalline uh, or, or um, a, a ultra flat surface and then uh, remove the gold from that surface uh, by, by uh, if it doesn't adhere well, by a process called template stripping. And this gives you atomically flat gold, and this will have a better uh, material properties. Uh, so you want to you can you want to make the, the you want to reduce losses as much as possible, but in some ways that's a physical limit that you can't really uh, do better than. Another limit that's important is the single channel limit. If you have a resonance, uh, there's a limit to how much the uh, scattering can happen from this resonance. Uh, you can see this if you take the this uh, ellipsoid and you look at the scattering uh, that comes from this ellipsoid. The maximum scattering you can get is given by the wavelength of the light, not the, it's not given, so you can absorb or scatter from an area which is given by the wavelength of the, of the light squared. It's not given by the size of the object or it has nothing to do with the object at all. And this is a very fundamental uh, property of uh, scatters and, and uh, absorbing um, uh, two-level systems. Uh, you can read about it in Jackson. It's the single channel limit. So the best you can do is, is scatter from a single channel. Uh, uh, you get an area which is comparable to the wavelength squared that you can scatter light from. So you can't squeeze more light into a small volume than you can capture from that area. So, so there's a certain limit to how much you can squeeze light down to the nanoscale based on the single channel limit. Of course, you can add more resonant channels so for every single resonant channel, you get the single channel limit associated with this. And this is what people have started to realize recently to really push this further. But again, this, this is very complicated to do and, and it is challenging, but it's an interesting way to, to go and get more field enhancement and more scattering. Uh, I will just, in the interest of time, I will take that question at the end and, and just uh, finish up uh, ways of getting enhancements here. Um, so uh, directivity is another way to, to get enhancement. Uh, obviously, if, if the emission is in all directions, you're not going to get as, as much uh, enhancement. But if you uh, limit the, the emission into one direction or you collect from a single direction, you can get enhancement. We worked on a phenomenon called directivity enhanced Raman scattering, where uh, in addition to surface enhanced Raman, if you shape the direction of the photons, you can get an enhancement of about a factor of 10 for the incident photon and another factor of 10 for the emitted photon. And overall, you get another enhancement of a factor of 100 in the total uh, Raman efficiency. And this really allowed us to go down to single molecule sensitivity quite efficiently. So you really want uh, all the light to go into one direction. And this is related a little bit to what I was talking about previously with the single channel limit. Essentially, if you take multiple uh, resonances and combine them in the near field, uh, their far field radiation pattern can, can give you this directivity. So there's some connection between these two concepts. Uh, this, is, this is an example of the single Ram, directivity enhanced Raman, which gave us single molecule uh, sensitivity. <coughs> Excuse me, but I won't, uh, I won't go into that in too much detail. Uh, again, uh, many others have looked at quantum uh, sources, single photon sources using this directivity concept. Uh, another important concept from, uh, from engineering is um, the maximum power transfer theorem. So I've talked about <clears throat> uh, reducing losses, uh, single channel limit, directivity, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> but what we want to do here is essentially we want to have our radiation losses equal our absorption losses. When we have some absorbing metal, <clears throat> we have the local field increased. We also increase in the losses there. So we don't want the losses to outweigh how much light is coupled in, but we also don't want, um, we don't want to have the coupling be too weak that we don't get enough light into the near field. And so there is uh, this maximum transfer uh, where, your, where, where your radiation losses equals your absorption losses. Uh, Non-locality is something that people have worried about in metals and it is believed to limit um, the, the field enhancements uh, because of the non-local response of the metals. 
although some uh, recent experimental works from my group and other groups have suggested that it's not playing a role, at least uh, in this regime. Uh, so this comes from the Fermi pressure, uh, but this really is an area which I think is, is still of active debate in the, in the, in the field. Uh, of course, with graphene, there's been some very clear demonstrations of non-local, of the non-local uh, response playing a role. Um, but there, it's a, an entirely different um, uh, wavelength regime. Uh, there's obviously, for nanostructures, you, you have to worry about tunneling at some point. If you make the gaps between two metals very small, then the electrons can tunnel across, and this leads to, uh, leads to effectively, you've shorted out the gap with a shunt, uh, shunt resistance coming from your tunneling um, path. And so you can look at the, uh, the response of the metal by a modified uh, Drude model where you modify it with the electron density in the gap, okay? So uh, this is interesting because it can actually give you enhancement in some cases, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and you can also get, uh, I saw another question, I'll get to those two questions at the end. Um, you can also have some, some uh, surface scattering, but again, this is not really, it's not really clear that this is uh, a real effect uh, in metals. Um, uh, some near-field studies have suggested that it actually isn't playing a role. Of course, if you do coat your metal with, with, a, with a chemical, uh, some sort of thiol or something like this, or uh, CTAP, you can have something called chemical interface damping, where electrons are transferred at the surface. And, and this can lead to some increased damping, so you want to have sort of pristine surfaces if you want to get rid of this. Uh, there's also Landau damping, which uh, allows electrons to, to scatter higher up in the, in the conduction band. Uh, and the, uh, the way that this happens is if you have a nanostructure or a sub-nanometer uh, structure, uh, you essentially provide the momentum matching which allows for the transition of electron higher up into the band. This momentum matching would not be allowed in sort of um, the usual case where the electron is just absorbing a uh, photon because the photon does not provide enough momentum. But if you, uh, if you do provide a nanostructure, this can give you some effectively a grading coupling, which allows to uh, some damping. Uh, and this is suggested to be limit, relevant for small sizes, less than two nanometers, but it doesn't happen all the time. And so you can still do quite well even in the presence of Landau damping. Uh, finally, you can have um, a melting. If you enhance the local field a lot, you can get a lot of uh, uh, intensity. This, if you don't get rid of that heat, that energy, you can get melting. Uh, this is a case where it's better to use apertures where your metal film will get rid of the heat than a nano rod. So for the same field enhancement, the simulation shows you get uh, about a thousand times increase in the field. Um, or even more than a thousand times increase in the, in the temperature, I should say, uh, for the same local field if you have a nanorod, because the nanorod cannot get rid of the heat uh, if it's isolated from the environment. Uh, of course, you can have very small cavities uh, in metals that are formed by just single atoms, and these are, you can talk about these as, as pickle cavities, but then if the atoms move around through the fusion, which gold will do, it's quite, surface, uh, surface is quite mobile, over time, if you're talking about things that are really at the, at the sub-nanometer scale, the, the surface will evolve and you'll get a change in the, in the properties of your, of your um, cavity. Uh, so these are the, the limits, and, and essentially we can, we can get rid of uh, many of these limits and, and we can uh, uh, do better and, and get the maximum enhancement by paying attention to each of these limits and trying to get rid of them. For example, you want to have efficient coupling, you want to use uh, directivity, you want to use uh, the maximum power transfer. Here's an example where we looked at uh, the maximum field that you'll get in, in small gaps, and we noticed that uh, you don't want to make the gaps really tiny because you do not get the maximum power transfer for the really tiny gaps. Uh, you want to sort of have the field, the gap at around four nanometers, and at that point your absorption equals your scattering and then you get the maximum power transfer, and so you get the maximum third harmonic generation. So that's something that's not obvious. People in plasmonics, they often talk about making things smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, but actually you kind of don't want to do that in many cases because you want to have the maximum power transfer. Uh, you can make use of nanoscale features like single atoms. Uh, you can also make 
use of epsilon and zero materials. So uh, there's a uh, Maxwell's equations uh, at, a, at interfaces will tell you that the displacement vector, the perpendicular component, is continuous. And so if one material has permittivity close to zero, then the other material, the field will be, um, the field will be uh, close to infinite in that near zero material. And we've shown this with J aggregates, which have very strong resonances. Uh, if you do uh, Raman on them, uh, they actually have permittivity near zero, and you can have this huge enhancement in the field. Uh, and with tunneling, you can imagine you can have something similar to this. Okay, so that is uh, it for my presentation. Uh, you want to make use of this epsilon node zero, directivity enhancement, and uh, maximum power transfer to get the best out of, out of, these, um, out of these materials and plasmonics in general. Okay, so I want to go back. Um, how can metasurfaces and answer some of the questions here? So I'll take them in the reverse order. Um, how can metasurfaces help in enhancing plasmonic effects? Um, so certainly metal surfaces, metasurfaces allow for having an effective local response, uh, which can give you permittivity near zero, or you can have some resonances at some wavelengths that you, you uh, want. Uh, so this is a very important effect. Um, so uh, uh, they give you types of responses that you might not see in conventional materials. Did you compare the proposed single ion technique with the typical reference techniques? Um, uh, so the single ion technique, I'm assuming you mean where we, where we had like uh, uh, single erbium emitters. Um, so we compared with uh, just the bulk solution and non-resonant apertures to see the, uh, the enhancement that, that we could achieve. Uh, other techniques have looked at ion implantation and, and uh, other effects, but they haven't been able to achieve um, uh, the selectivity that we have. They, they're fairly uh, non-deterministic still. Uh, so what is the application to plasmonic solar cell? Uh, well, one thing with these upconverters we can talk about using uh, metal nanostructures to enhance the upconversion efficiency and thereby harvest infrared light that would not usually be absorbed by, uh, by the uh, solar cell. Uh, it is a really tricky subject to add plasmonics to solar cells because the minute you put a metal in there, you're going to have losses. And you don't want to add losses to a solar cell. Uh, you want all of those photons to be absorbed. So you really want to put the metal away from the solar cell or after the solar cell has done its job of absorbing, uh, and then you get your enhancement on the photons that are not absorbed normally by the solar cell, and that's where you get the maximum enhancement. Uh, are there any other questions right now? Uh, sir, I have one more. Uh, sir, okay, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Am I audible, sir, or should I write it down? Uh, you can talk. Yeah, sir. Uh, uh, the single about the single ion technique, sir. Uh, how it is uh, better than the conventional technique in the uh, in two thousand sixteen? Uh, you were mentioning that uh, which won the Nobel Prize, and uh, uh, how it is better than that, apart from the trapping size. Uh. So uh, it is really the, the trapping size that's really important. So uh, if you look at all the work that, that uh, you know, Ashkin did an amazing job with optical tweezers. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for this. Uh, many people in the optical tweezer community felt that it came quite late. Um, and really what he won the Nobel Prize for was because of all of his applications to biology and biophysics, understanding how single um, proteins interact, how viruses pack in DNA, how uh, DNA uh, behaves, um, how, uh, um, you know, uh, the proteins moving along filaments. So all of these have been studied with, with, uh, with optical tweezers. But in all of those studies, they needed to add some large bead to the, to the um, they needed to add a large bead to the, uh, to the thing that was being studied. 
And the problem with this is, is it really, um, it's, uh, it meant that you can't, um, uh, you're, you're changing the thing that's being studied. You're adding something that's large that, that's hindering its motion. It's, uh, it usually requires some fluorescent marker or something like this. So you, know, you can't really say for sure that you're actually looking at the protein uh, by itself in its normal environment. In our case, we're, we're able to trap single proteins without any tethers, without any large spherical uh, objects with microspheres near them. And the result is that we're able to, to do a very good job of, um, of looking at protein folding without any fluorescence involved. Uh, and, and we can look at protein DNA interactions um, and protein small molecule interactions, uh, all at the single molecule level, all without using any tethers. Uh, so it is really about trapping small and smaller objects. Okay, so, so did you mean uh, by all, I can uh, summarize uh, that uh, pretreatment was required in that technique and in, your, in this new technique, the pretreatment was not required uh, for the application. Yeah, so, so we, we just look at uh, proteins themselves, so we don't have to yeah. attach them to yeah. anything. Yeah, we don't, we can use it directly, yeah. yeah. And uh, what, uh, what do you think can be the disadvantage of the new technique? Uh, nanoplasmonic. What is the advantage? The disadvantage. What can be the disadvantage as when? Oh, we... disadvantage. Well, yeah. you have to use nanostructure, and also um, with the optical tweezer technique. Before, uh, if you were looking at fairly large things like cells, uh, you could operate in free solution. Uh, whereas with plasmonics, you always have to operate close to a surface. So there are some surface interactions that you have to be worried about. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was a wonderful session. Participants, if you have any question, you can put it down to the chat box. And uh, I think I have received one more question in the chat box. Uh, please share the software tools used in your study. So, uh, Mr. Deepak was asking about the software tools uh, used in the study. Uh, yes. Um... Yeah, so we use lots of uh, lots of tools. Uh, a lot of the time, we we're interested in in uh, in using uh, analytic methods. So we try with the permittivity for the ellipsoid, for example. Uh, the reason I chose that is because you can write the equations with your hands and and you can understand it uh, very well. Uh, that's my preferred approach: is to try to develop a circuit theory or some sort of uh, simple analytic model that allows me to really analyze with pencil and paper uh, what's going on. Uh, but we do use other software tools. There's a company uh, in Vancouver called Numerical. They provide excellent software uh, for doing finite difference time domain simulations, uh, as well as various other techniques. Uh, they were just bought out by ANSYS, I believe. Uh, I know lots of people in the field use COMSOL, there's HFSS, there's CST. So there's lots of different options out there for people uh, to do simulation. Essentially, I think they're all very good. Uh, uh, people have done very well with all of these different uh, options. I, I don't want to, um, you know, specifically promote one versus another, uh, but, but uh, you can look in the field. Uh, we, use, we cite uh, which tools we use. Uh, in my own group, we predominantly use Lumerical. Um, I like that tool personally. Um, but uh, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to uh, say that the other tools are not good. So, uh, can we use uh, MATLAB also for solving these equations? Yes, I can. Uh, for a lot of the things that I'm doing here, I'm using MATLAB. Uh, but if you want to use comprehensive electromagnetic solvers, you have to use something like finite difference time domain technique or a finite element method or something like this. So. So these are challenging to, to do in MATLAB because it just is not, if you're doing a full three-dimensional simulation, it's quite challenging. If you're just doing uh, multi-layer structures uh, in one dimension, like a SPR, uh, then definitely you can solve that with a transfer matrix technique very quickly with MATLAB. Uh, and I posted a tutorial uh, in, in one of my earlier slides, and I think the second slide, I showed a, a tutorial that I wrote uh, for IEEE uh, magazine, uh, I forget which one, I think it was uh, Nanotechnology magazine, quite some time ago, and, and in there I share some MATLAB code uh, for, for looking at uh, transmission matrix through different layers. 
Uh, but it's very simple. Anyone can do that. Yeah. Thank you. Anupman, do you have any questions? Any more questions from the participants? Okay, thank you, sir. It was a wonderful ses uh, session, uh, insightful for me as well as the participants, for the participants as well. Uh, I think Anupma, we lost Anupma due to network connectivity. Uh, Anupma, are you there?